Uh, it was great to be here, especially seeing as Rick did the organization this time. <laughs> I'd had to do a bit less, except I'm still doing the camera work, apparently. Um, so welcome to the third RISC V workshop. So in my presentation, um, I just want to focus on, um, there's a lot of changes as we transition away from Berkeley and out into um, the real world. And I want to talk a lot about that, as well as a bunch of open issues. And one of my goals in this presentation is really to seed the discussions we hopefully will be having later on during the breakouts um, and during the lunch and the poster session. So I want to get you thinking about all the open issues we still have in RISC V land. Um, and uh, so I'll just start off with some updates. Rick kind of went over this, but we really, it's been amazing. We started out in 2010 as this three-month project that took four years to produce the final, the spec. Uh, but now, even just one and a half years later, we have this massive workshop, more sold out several times, um, uh, 80 companies and universities, foundations launching, major support, um, a lot of universities adopting it for education. Um, Indian government adopted it as an ISA standard, and there's a lot of RISC-V implementations on the way. I don't know how many there are out there, probably 30 or 40 I've heard of. Um, and the ecosystem is really filling out in terms of the, the, the software land. So I just want to focus on what's been happening at Berkeley. The Berkeley, obviously, we've been driving this. Um, at some point soon, this will shift over to the uh, foundation driving this. But just where we are at Berkeley, um, there's been things we've been working on, the compressed extension. Uh, to do code compression. We, um, Andrew originally developed this back in for his master's thesis back in 2011. Uh, he got a bit busy after that. Then I would say we released the Daddy Bear version, uh, version 1.7, uh, in May 2015. And this was, here's a whole bunch of different compressed encodings that may or may not be useful. Um, what do you all think of that? We put that out of the community. The community came back and said, well, we don't see the reason for all those extra ones. So then we re kind of released this version 1.8, which I would call the Baby Bear, and that was slash back. And it turned out then people complained, the code got bigger. Um, and so responding to the community, we've reworked and expanded this new version 1.9 that was released um, uh, in November. And we think this is kind of the mummy bear. You know, this seems to be about right for the compressed extension. And the way I know that is nobody said anything about it, like zero feedback since we put this one out there. So I assume everybody is very happy with this. And um, so we're going to freeze it, that version, so or at least very soon. So this is really a request for, you know, last chance to say anything before we go freeze this up, right, the, the version 1.9. So the idea is just to take version 1.9 and move that over to become frozen uh, as version 2. And remember in, you know, RISC V land, you know, freezing it is a one-time deal. Um, so, you know, speak up now if you have any opinions on that. And this will be a good topic to talk about at uh, the breakouts. Um, so the privileged architecture is something we've been working on, on a lot. Um, uh, version 1.7 released back in May 2015. We've had a lot of feedback on this, um, and we've been going through digesting this and reworking it and incrementally, uh, you know, you've seen in the code bases, uh, working through some of the changes. We're kind of behind schedule on this. We'd hope to, uh, I'll tell you why we're behind schedule. There's a lot been going on. But we hope to get an updated draft out um, addressing all that feedback in a month or two, um, and including one thing people have been asking for is the QMU system uh, that will be updated soon to match the current spec. That's, uh, that's work in progress. And the one thing with the privileged architecture, we always thought this would take a while. Um, it's uh, pretty complicated uh, in many ways. It has to work with a lot of existing OS software. Um, and one thing you'll notice in the title, I'm now, it's the reference privileged architecture. One goal in the design was that the whole privileged architecture was a module you could swap out and replace with a different privileged architecture if you wanted to. Um, although we imagine this will be the dominant one used by most uh, code in the near future. Um, it's designed to support standard OSs like Linux and uh, BSD. Um, but for this reference privileged architecture, we um, really think it take a little while for this to settle down. There's been, we have the free BSD folks actually got their port up and running. Um, uh, L4, uh, microkernel up and running as well as a Linux port. And I think we need a bit more banging against it with some more OS development, some more driver development before we really um, finalize it. Um, but I think the, the next step is really to get this updated draft spec out to people, um, including the uh, reference implementations for people to look at. So I think it's going to take a little bit longer for this to really settle down. But that's a good thing. You know, that's, it needs some more time. Um, so the vector extension V, I talked about this at the last workshop. Um, we sketched out the design. And we really just haven't had time to work on releasing a draft of this in time for this workshop. That was a plan also. Um, but. Um, to compensate for that, we did open source the Watcher Vector Coprocessor, which is Berkeley's uh, uh, vector unit that we've been working on for quite a few years. Uh, I think this is version four of the architecture. And we just released the, the code and also three tech reports to go over the uh, 
uh, design of that uh, vector coprocessor. Now, one thing that will be confusing, and we understand this is confusing, but please don't be confused. So the Huacha ISA is not meant to be a proposal for the fee extension. Huacha was a research project at Berkeley exploring a particular way of building an in-order decoupled data parallel accelerator. It's more appropriate to replace something like a GPU. We don't view it as appropriate for being the V extension and RIS-5. However, the Huacha microarchitecture actually includes a lot of the microarchitectural widgets you will need to implement the V extension. So we view having the source code base out there as useful for people to look at so they understand what will be implied by the uh, V extension when it's uh, defined uh, coming out later. Um, so we continue to do stuff. People always ask me what's Berkeley up to. You know, we um, uh, continue to work on stuff. Um, there's some work going on at uh, how to use virtual local store. This is an idea from Henry Cook's master thesis back in 2009. We're actually implementing this now. And it's a way to use a portion of the cache as a scratch pad. And we do it in a nice way that works well with operating systems, uh, for example. Um, and um, this is something that I think will eventually turn into a proposal for an extension, is how to support this uh, virtual local store. Another thing we're looking at is user-level DMA, a way of um, supporting that that works together with the VLS. These actually can be done independently, these two features, but they do work well together. Um, and these are both things that might form ISA proposals in the future. There's relevant students that should be here, so um, you can uh, go search them out if you're interested in what's happening in these areas. Um, so open source course, so uh, last retreat, uh, last workshop, sorry, we, um, Chris Sudo gave a talk on Boom. He's gonna give an updated talk um, tomorrow about Boom, the Berkeley out of order machine. Um, and last time it wasn't open source, but I'm happy to say now it is open source. So Boom is now out there, people can grab that. Um, also in between the last workshop and this one, we released vScale, which was, people wanted a Verilog version of the RISC-5 core they could just take. Not everybody is comfortable with Chisel uh, for some reason. Um, people just want to pick up something in Verilog, so we did an implementation in Verilog for people to use. Of course, this is just the Berkeley, this is just Berkeley's um, open source cores. There are many, many other people out there uh, building RISC-V open source cores, which is great. Okay, so Berkeley's been doing a lot of stuff. We drove this, originated it, you know, set this whole thing up. Um, and now we're in this phase of transitioning RISC-V out of Berkeley, and there's many dimensions to this transition. One thing we talked about is the foundation taking over the standards process. Um, and the idea is there's a lot of companies now investing substantially in RISC-V. They want a stable place to go talk about the issues related to RISC-V, and that's why we created the RISC-V Foundation. Um, another aspect is the tool support. So for all the open source tools, we are in the process now. We've started the process of upstreaming everything to the main line. So we won't have to, you know, we can stay uh, up, up to date with the most recent developments in all the tools. Things like um, binutils, glibc, gcc, Linux, LLVM. Uh, we're in, all of these will be upstream when we started that process. Um, there's a lot of uh, paperwork involved in this. Um, if any of you have done this before, um, and any of you have dealt with a public university dealing with this, there's a lot of lawyers and things to get the appropriate bits of paper signed by the appropriate people, but we're working on that. We don't, I don't, don't see any roadblocks, so all the code base should be able to go up upstream. Um, now, probably the biggest change is, you know, we started this back in 2010, and uh, PhDs at Berkeley in systems usually last you know, six, seven years, sometimes longer. Um, but students do actually graduate. And, you know, one of the problems with university projects is the students graduate and then the project dies because the next student has their pet project to go and do. They don't necessarily want to support, you know, the last guy's stuff, the last gal's stuff. So, um, in particular, the Redress 5 developers are no longer at Berkeley. Um, so, Dr. Waterman, is maybe here in the audience somewhere. Uh, Andrew graduated or finished his thesis. Andrew claims, uh, Jonsup claims he's almost done. But, um, but those guys will basically no longer be UCB. So um, I'll talk about where they went to in a minute. But there are a lot of newer students who are going to keep working on RISC V at Berkeley. So even though you know the initial wave of students are now graduating, next six months a bunch of the others will also graduate. There are some newer students. We're going to keep using RISC V at Berkeley. It's not like we're going to stop using it. We built the whole thing so we could have a great research infrastructure. And it's great that all you guys are now helping us build, you know, the world's best research infrastructure for computer architecture, and that was kind of one of my goals. Um, so we're gonna keep doing this at Berkeley, keep developing it at Berkeley, but there is this initial wave of students now graduating and leaving Berkeley. And where are they going? Well, some of them are going to this startup we've created called Sci-5. I just wanna spend one slide talking about Sci-5. Um, so the founders are myself, Jansup and Andrew, 
Uh, and we're backed by uh, Sutter Hill Ventures. Our CEO is uh, Stefan, who's sitting at the front there. And our goal is really to keep supporting Open Source RISC V commercially. Um, so please come talk to us if you think you'd want to build chips around um, customized RISC V processes. That's what we'll be doing. Um, but I think the important thing is the students have graduated, but they're going to keep working on RISC V, but now in this commercial context, and they're going to keep supporting the open source um, the community. So we think this is very valuable, and we really want to change the hardware industry model uh, to really have open source be a big player in the hardware industry, which has not been up till now. OK, so that's Sci-5. Um, yeah, and that's our tagline, freeing silicon because Moore's law only ends once. Right? So, um, so the landscape, uh, RISC-V, I just want to give an update on how this looks. So we kind of have the foundation at the center of everything. So everybody who's doing anything significant commercially with RISC-V should be a member. Um, I guess we're up to 16 members now uh, at this point in time. We have the government, public open source. We have the universities, governments who are putting funding in to develop RISC-V. Um, for example, the guys in IIT Madras, they have $90 million in funding. They've started to release open source cores, uh, BSD licensed cores funded by the Indian government. Um, universities such as MIT is adopting RISC-V for their teaching, uh, education. So now you're going to see a whole wave of undergraduates who are going to be pre-trained in RISC-V um, uh, architecture tools uh, coming out. Uh, we have nonprofit private ventures like Low Risk. They'll be giving an update, um, uh, I think, tomorrow. Um, now, I'm also pinged. A lot of you in the audience will have pinged me. I have talked to a lot of other companies not present here. There's a lot of internal development at RISC-V at very major companies, including companies not on the currently membership, uh, part of the membership. I would say this is where most of the RISC-V development is actually going on in terms of engineer years in industry is in projects you will never hear about. Um, so, but there's a lot of activity. People are using this stuff. Um, then there are other commercial providers, which are companies that announce that they're supporting and doing RISC-V, um, such as BlueSpec and Rumble uh, and ourselves at Sci-5. Right, so this landscape's kind of filling out um, a lot of activity. Now, that's kind of the, uh, the transition part of the talk. I want to move on now to issues. So I want to kind of tee up a bunch of topics that I think people should be thinking about, talking about at the workshop. It's great to have everybody here in person uh, to brainstorm about these issues. Um, so one of the big ones is, you know, there's a lot of holes and ambiguities in the specification, and I'll go over some of those. And one of the big missing things so far, which actually has been deliberate that it's been missing, is to talk about concrete um, hardware platforms and the specification of those. But it's now time to actually go do that, um, uh, to work on the, the hard platform specifications. This is very expensive ice. I hear that all you guys who drink cocktails, you know, know that you know, there's an extra dollar to get this special ice in your cocktail, right? And this is being very carefully frozen, so there are no holes, and that's why it's clear, right? Our RISC V spec wasn't frozen quite as carefully, right? So there have been a few holes. So we've been trying to work through um, and clearing up some of these. Um, some of these are really, really details that only hardcore implementers who actually test this stuff will, will understand. But um, floating point NANDs is one place where it was incomplete in the, in the spec that we froze. Um, the implementations did that we put out from Berkeley did one thing that we have figured out wasn't quite exactly the right thing. Um, and so we have resolved a bunch of issues around um, the actual bidding codings of quiet signaling NANs and how they should be done. Along the way, we learned many interesting things about every other ind industry ISA, how they do this stuff. Um, I think we looked at five of the top ISAs have five different encodings for the NANs, right? And um, for example, a fun fact is that Oracle developed, oh, sorry, Sun developed Java. Java has a NAN encoding. Um, Spark has a NAN encoding, which is different from the Java NAN encoding, right? So go figure. Um, but we've adopted one that's basically the same as ARM and basically the same as Java. Um, so the details are now in the updated spec. Um, there was some talk in the mailing list, and I think we figured all these out. Um, the CSR read write semantics, control status registers, what exactly it means to write a value into the instructions retired register, uh, what it means to read and write um, to not uh, want to read or write a given CSR. Uh, I think we'll resolve those issues. Um, now, perhaps the biggest issue, and this is going to take some time, is the memory model. And this is uh, far from resolved. And I'll go into that. Um, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, the other one is the hypervisor support. There's a place in the spec to add the hypervisor support. There's really been no um, progress traction or 
as far as I can tell, much interest in pushing that right now. Um, and this is something that we'll probably want to spend some time on before we freeze the privileged architecture. Um, now, the other, uh, going back to the memory model, well, of course, there's many other holes to be discovered, right? There's, uh, there's plenty of other things I guess you'll find out as we do more stuff. Now, the memory model is probably um, the trickiest thing to get right. A lot of industry ones are not very well specified. I encourage you to go read the specs for memory models out there and tell me if you really believe them. Uh, the big problem is you really need a, a formal spec that's kind of been lacking out there in most of the commercial, well, every other commercial ISA. Um, so what we're trying to hope to get towards into something I think would be great for a working group is to work on a formal spec of the whole ISA plus the memory model to actually have a formal spec of the entire thing. Um, and this would be an industry first to actually have this. And this is kind of important if you worry about things like, you know, not just correctness, but also security. Um, so this is uh, an important topic. And I'd like to see RISC-V be the first to actually do this correctly. Um, there is a bunch of, so I want to separate, there's some issues of how you express the standard formally. Separately is like what should the standard be in terms of which orderings are legal or illegal. And there's a lot of subtleties there. And the, I would say even the very best people working on this field disagree about what's important. So I think risk 5 is a way of actually maybe making progress in the field as a whole by defining the right memory model. We deliberately left the, the hardware platform spec um, till later because most of the work is in the upper layers and most of that work is reusable regardless of what kind of hard, hardware platform you're building. And one of the goals in RISC-V was really to design everything in a very modular way to get maximum reuse of every piece of the ISA spec and every piece of the other parts of the specification. Now the hardware platform um, is things like, where's the memory map? We often get these questions on the mailing list, where is the interrupt controller in RISC-V, right? It kind of depends on what kind of platform you're running on, but we're getting to the point in time where we now need to start defining this. There's enough um, work being done there, and we have a session coming up on things like boot and um, uh, OS, low-level OS support. Other things need to define interrupt and power management for the different platforms. So we, at the point now, we can start, I think, working on this and going through this. To, to frame this a little, I think there are three major platforms that uh, will be spec'd out. Um, three different spaces. So one is the microcontroller space. Um, you know, very simple memory mapped I.O., really no caches, no DRAM in these systems. A lot of them, you know, all the memories on chip or in package. Um, you know, maybe one or a few cores. There's that level of platform. There's what I would say is the apps processor level of platform, which is, you know, thing in your tablet, smartphone, car navigation unit, whatever, something that can run an operating system, but it's really just a single chip scale system. And then there's the rack scale machine. So we're sitting here at Oracle. These guys build these rack scale machines. Um, so how do you build something with hundreds of nodes in uh, sort of rack scale, and what should that platform look like? Um, this is one of the connections actually with Rapid IO, which is disk, uh, Rick's uh, one of Rick's other other jobs uh, is running Rapid IO. So um, so one of the un un things we're not completely clear about is what extent can the platform specs? We want obviously we want to avoid gratuitous incompatibilities between these platforms. There's going to be necessary differences because they're trying to do different things. Um, but I think now is the time to kind of start laying out these different platforms and standardizing them. And the goal here is obviously to enable maximum reuse of all the work people do in the software layers to drive these. Um, yeah, I should have mentioned back um, when I was talking about Sci-5, so you'll see Tim will be up next. And Tim uh, is at Sci-5, and he's been working on a debug um, spec. And that's an example of one piece of this platform that needs to get defined. And so at Sci-Fi, we've been putting the resources in to get that done for the community. You know, we want to put that out as a proposal to the foundation to have this uh, debug proposal um, solidified that everybody can use. Um, okay. So there's a lot of work to do. I just wanted to see the discussion uh, and give you an update on what happened in Berkeley. And I'm happy to take questions in the time remaining. No questions. Yep. Tommy? No movement on the B-spec. Say again, sorry? The B-spec, the part of the binary uh, B? bit, bit manipulation. Oh, the question was, has there been any movement on the B, the binary bit twiddling spec? No. Nobody seems interested in it, so no movement. Remember, you're the community. If you want something to happen, go do it. That's going to be my standard response when somebody says, where's the X? I'll say, do you want to propose X? Back. So the mailing list is that you should talk to Tommy. Oh, here. 
Um, the, the mailing list is, the, there's the ISA dev list. If you want to talk about standard stuff, go to the ISA dev mailing list. Um, and that would be the place to get people talking about starter thread. So the question was, what's the current status of verification and validation relative to the ISA spec? Um, I don't know how to answer that question. Um, different groups have stuff. There's the Berkeley has put out some test suites. It'd be great to improve that. Um, we welcome donations. Oh, we recently did actually, from Berkeley, I didn't mention this, we did put out our torture framework, which, and there's a tech report on that, which is a, a constrained random instruction test generator, which will help with uh, verification. But yeah, a more complete story would be good. Oh, and there's a post, there's a post from that t tonight. Right, so Chris is sitting over there. So, so one of the things to note about just even this discussion, each of these questions in and of themselves are potential topics for the breakout sessions later this afternoon, right? Because part of what we're trying to achieve there is what are the, as, and Krista had you know, a few items uh, in his slide deck here, but what are the uh, subcommittees and task groups that we want to get started on right away to answer the who do we talk to question that was at the back, right? Um, so that there's a, there's a committee that is working on this not just the guys who are trying to graduate from Berkeley, right? <laughs>